today on The Active Word. Maybe God just decided, you know what? I'm going to set aside Israel. I will now bless the Gentile people, but for the Jew, now, no longer. You ever thought that thought? They did in Paul's day. Love means never needing to say you're sorry. At least that's what Ryan O'Neill and Allie McGraw would have had us believe in the old movie Love Story. Remember that one? But anyone who's married knows that love means having to say you're sorry a whole bunch. So what can we know about love? Well, today on The Active Word, Pastor Bob Coy will show us what God has to say about true, redemptive love. Let's join Pastor Bob now for this study of the book of Ruth. The message is called Romantic Redemption. Love story. Ruth and Naomi. If you're my age, Ryan and Allie. What's that? Well, your Snickers do reveal that some of you remember quite well. The year 1970, the then Hollywood hotties, Ryan O'Neill and Ally McGraw, starred in a film. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Yeah, love story. Love story. And that was a time when love. It was a time when love was free. And love was foolish. Love was sweet, and love was silly. So from that film, the forever phrase, love means never having to say you're sorry. If that's not a bag of baloney, come on now. Who are you kidding? That's such hogwash. Love means never having to say you're sorry. You must not be married. What's that? Man, this I know. If you are married, if you want to be married, if you want to stay married, love means having to say you're sorry a couple of times a day. And I think that was Israel's mistake. What do you mean, Pastor Bob? God had this special covenantal relationship with Israel. He promised to bless, love, care for, provide What happens when you take that kind of grace for granted? Well, you miss the fact that God's word is, listen, a two-edged sword. Two-edged. Yeah. On the one side, his great grace. On the other side, his punishment profound. Now, please tune in. My God is really, 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 really merciful. But you know he's also in the business of judging sin. And if we as believers have found our great friend Jesus Christ is such a good buddy, don't forget he's also Almighty God. Now I understand that most of us were attracted to Sunday school Jesus. Yeah, the Sunday school Jesus says, yes, all the little children come to me. And we all like to think of Jesus sitting down, long white robe, kids playing on his lap, laughing with them, telling stories. But remember, in the Bible, there's also Revelation Jesus with a sword that comes out of his mouth as he simply cuts up the heathen nations because of their rebellion. They're inviting wrath. Now, again, I like Sunday school Jesus much more than Revelation Jesus. Most of us would. But Sunday school Jesus is also very much Revelation Jesus. And I think that's what Israel missed. Missed? Yeah, it was a message Moses provided. He presented the possibility of punishment and penalty. Where is that at? It's Deuteronomy 28. Drawing your attention to the 47th verse, there we read, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in nakedness, in need of everything, and he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you? Sounds pretty serious. Sounds pretty severe. Oh, sin is. We continue. This time, verse 62 of the same chapter, 28. For you shall be left few in number... Whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Verse 64. 
Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples, from one end of the earth to the other. And there you'll serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. In verse 66, your life shall hang in doubt before you. And you shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. Pause right there, your attention, please. Stop, preacher, what? Let me ask you. You look at Israel today. Haven't you ever scratched your head and said, these are chosen people? These are chosen? Look at the state of Israel. Not just its condition, its climate. No, look at its size. It's such a sliver. You've got a piece of property 75 miles north and south, 25 miles east and west. Do you understand how big Israel is? Do you know that you could take the entire state of Israel and if you overlaid it here, the state of Florida, go from Miami to West Palm Beach, it would go from the Atlantic Ocean on into the Everglades. And it's that little tiny sliver state that the whole world continues to fight over. Think about it. Well, Pastor Bob, I am thinking about it. If these are God's chosen people. They're still fighting over this little sliver state. It looks to me like quite possibly their rebellion. I mean, the horror of the Holocaust. Maybe God just cast them to the side. Maybe God's just forsaken his promise. Maybe God just decided, you know what? I'm going to set aside Israel. I will now bless the Gentile people. But for the Jew, now, no longer. You ever thought that thought? They did in Paul's day. So writing to the church in Rome, Romans chapter 11, verse 1, we read, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God's not cast away his people, whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what scripture says of Elijah? And how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed down your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. Do you remember that story? Do you remember how Elijah felt like he was the only true Jew? He was the only real follower of Jehovah. He was the only one. Verse 4. But what does the divine response say to him? And in other words, what was God's answer to him thinking he was the only true Jew? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to bow, God replied. So then even, or even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Your attention, please. If in fact God has done away with Israel, explain this, Paul writes. Why am I, an Israelite, a believer? Now, I'll take it one step further. If God is done with Israel, then there would not be a chance for someone who's born of Hebrew faith to believe. I'll prove you otherwise. There are people right now in this room who were born of Jewish persuasion of faith, but today Jesus is their Messiah. If you happen to be one of those, would you raise your hand for a minute? Look around the room. Do you see how many hands raised? Now, what it, that's wonderful. Do 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 you understand how that happened? That's the remnant according to grace. God in his grace says, I love Israel so much, so much, I'm still working within Israel. You say, well, wait a second then. Why in the fact would God choose to set aside some, give few an opportunity, but at the same time outreach to the Gentile nations? Oh, it's verse 11 of Romans chapter 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? And in other words, if in fact, due to their rebellion, I have redemption, what happens when they believe? What a glorious day it will be when God lifts the veil, pulls the stupor from national Israel, and they suddenly see for the very first time, with God's help, that Jesus Christ was, in fact, the promised Messiah. He says, oh, that's going to be such a glorious day. We continue in verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, as much as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means, and again, he employs the same hope, that I might provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? 
For if the first fruit is holy, that is, if Jewishness, if the Hebrew faith is in fact holy, he says, well, then the lump is also holy. The lump, well, that's how I happened. I'm a part of that lump. For if the root is holy, so then also are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, Oh, some of the branches are broken off. And we'll come back to some of the branches being broken off. And you, that's me, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Don't boast against the branches. And in other words, if you're a Gentile believer, don't make it some kind of antagonistic point to the Jew. Here's why. He says, if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. This is the Judeo-Christian faith, not the Christian Judeo faith. He says in verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Your attention, please. So if you're a note taker, here's how you'd write it. You'd say, Israel's rebellion leads to Gentile redemption. That's exactly what happened. Again, Israel's rebellion leads to Gentile redemption. Let me illustrate it to you this way. You got kids. Let's say you have a dozen kids. Now, that's a lot in your family, I understand. But Some of them Jewish, some of them Gentile. It's a great big family. It's a place for everybody. But here's what happened. Gentiles start behaving badly. Now, so do the Jews. But because the Jews are your children's children, these are the ones you were able to actually birth naturally. Your Gentile children happen to be your adopted kids. Here's what happens. If your Jewish kids are misbehaving, hey, hey, I'm going to punish you, and you're going to go back to the bedroom. I want you to go sit in your bedroom. Go sit in your bedroom. Now, the Jewish kid goes back in his bedroom. He sits there. He's being punished. But while you're playing with the Gentile kids, the Jewish kid is looking out the door going, why are you playing with my sisters and brothers? What are you doing out there? Why? I want to come back out and play. And that is exactly the implications of the Gentile provoking the Jew unto Jesus. If you've just joined us, we're midway through this teaching today, Romantic Redemption with Pastor Bob Coy here on The Active Word. If you didn't catch the first part by any chance, you can hear it online at activeword.org. And if you haven't yet checked us out online, we invite you to do that today. Each month, we've got new resources, including daily devotionals and podcasts. Head on over to activeword.org and see how God's Word can help you with whatever you're facing. That's the truth. Again, that's activeword.org. For now, with more of today's message, here's Pastor Bob. Today, when I meet Jewish people, I have such a heart for the Jews. And when I meet them, I know that I know something they don't know. And I also understand that some of them won't know. Why? Because there's this blindness that's happened in part until the last Gentile gets saved. So in my conversation, it sometimes will go like this. Hey, you're Jewish. Oh, man, that's incredible. And then I'll always say this. Man, I wish I was born Jewish. Excuse me? You wish you were born Jewish? Oi, what is this? I say, hey, hey, you need to understand. And this is what I'll say. Your heritage, your Hebrew heritage, your forefathers, if I could actually be tied to that, oh, you have such a rich heritage. I mean, I was reading the other day in the Psalms, and I was reading David, you know, your father, your forefather in faith. And, I, and here's what happens. As I begin to simply share my love for the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, there are many times in their life is a, Really? Well, what else were you reading? And it's as if, I don't know, uh, you can put down someone's religion, but if in fact you simply extol your own, what happens? Well, imagine for a moment that somebody has a dumb, dumb sucker. You know, just a small little dumb, dumb sucker. Just a little stick of sugar candy and it's right there and then they have it. And you have a big 12-inch zoo pop. You know, the big kind you get at the zoo? Multicolored. Uh, uh. Let me say, you don't have to say to them, what do you do with that dumb dumb? Oh, look what I got. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is lick your, your big 12 inch new pop. Hi. I have Messiah. What have you got? Oh, really? I was reading your scriptures. I was worshiping your God. And here's what happens the Jew will sometimes look at the Gentile and go, wait a minute. You do worship God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you study the book of Ruth. You've worked your way from Genesis to Malachi. I mean, you Christians really take our, our book and our God pretty serious. I'm, I'm going to stop by that, Calvary, and find out what all you guys are reading over there. That's my God. What are you doing with my God? I got your God and I got your Messiah. What do you think about that? 
And here's what the Apostle Paul says. Apostle Paul says, I'm provoking my own people to jealousy because I'm having a blast with their Messiah. But here's what I'm wondering, Pastor Bob. Well, what are you wondering? I'm wondering what this has to do with the book of Ruth at all. Was oh, that what you were wondering? Yeah, I, I don't understand it. Well, go with me to the book of Ruth. You see, because when you get to the book of Ruth and we get to the second chapter, you will hear me say that the Bible is filled with types and templates pictures and patterns. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me tell you what a type is, okay? A type, first of all, and for those of you note takers, draw your attention to the big screen. You can follow with me. A type is a character and image that presents a picture of a scriptural truth. And in other words, there's times where I read the Bible verse by verse and, of course, word for word. But there's times where, as you're reading the Bible verse for verse and word for word, that you're missing that God is saying something to us a little bit more. If we'll look below the word and the sentence and the page and the letter, if you look a little deeper, you're going to see something. And the more you know the Bible, the more you see the Bible is this, listen, integrated divine message system. Did you guys understand that it's not one book? The Bible, it's 66 different books over a 1,400-year time span, 40 different authors. It's an integrated message system. And that what we read in Daniel, we'll also find, hey, wait a second, Jeremiah said that. Well, look what it says in the book of Genesis about God. Well, you know who else said that? Leviticus. And you see the character of God. You see the glory of God in this colorful form. Why? Again, it's not one book. But with these 66 books, and when you begin to hear and know the story from cover to cover, it's a love story, and it truly, truly is a work of redemption. So let me get back to the type and give you an example. A type in the Bible might be Abraham, who is for us in the scriptures a type of God the Father. Another type for us would be Isaac. And these are just, this is just an example. He's a picture of Christ the Son. Now, when you know that Abraham is a picture of God the Father and that Isaac's a picture of Christ the Son, when you're reading through Genesis chapter 22, you see something just absolutely, you know, jaw-dropping happen. Abraham is called to sacrifice his son. It's his only son, and it's his son of promise. Isaac is willing to go to the altar with his father. So as he goes to the altar with his father and lays his life down willingly, just as the knife is lifted to slay his son, an angel stops and says, no, you don't have to do this. Now, we have a picture of God the father willing to slay his son for the sake of, well, it's the perfect sacrifice. Now, Isaac gets off the altar. He turns to his dad, Abraham. He says, dad, we still have to offer sacrifice because the Lord is truly here. And then Abraham says this, and I love it because when you see it in the Hebrew, it just says it this way. God will provide himself a sacrifice. And then they find the lamb. Listen again. God will provide himself a sacrifice, then you find the lamb. So in a moment of just kind of reading through, you don't see this. And then when you have a little more information, you go types, templates, pictures, patterns. You go, wait a second. Wow, that's just like God the Father offering his son. And Jesus Christ is the perfect lamb. God did provide himself a sacrifice. Why? Because Jesus Christ is in fact, oh, this I, I like this. So that's just an example. Let's move to our study, the book of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, we find there's Elimelech. And Elimelech, in the first chapter, we discovered he's that faithless father. He's the father who should be full of faith, trusting that God will provide during a time of famine food. But because he's faithless, he leaves the promise, Bethlehem, house of bread, to Moab, the wash pot of God. Now, not only in the story do you have this faithless father, but you also have his two sons, Malon and Chilion. They're both sickly sons. And what do I mean by sickly? Well, you know that Elimelech dies... While in exile, the sons die while in exile. And because they're sickly sons, they never reproduce. I'm going to say that again because some of you need to hear this. There's a part of Israel that's not reproducing. There's a sickness, it's unbelief. The unbelief is not due to famine, lack of food, it's lack of faith. But in our story, not only do we have Elimelech the father, who's faithless, Malan and Chile and sickly sons, we also have Naomi. Now, who is Naomi? Naomi will be for us, for this chapter, a picture of national Israel. See her representing the nation of Israel. We also have Orpah, who was, of course, one of the son's now wives, 
who he dies, leaves her behind. She types for us an unbelieving Gentile person, an unbelieving Gentile nation. So that if she chooses to go back to her gods and her people, she blows off the hope and promise that Ruth lays hold of. So Ruth is a picture of us of a believing Gentile nation or a believing Gentile person. Now, stay with me here because this is too cool in my opinion. Ruth is a Moabite. Moabite. Now, what does that mean to me, Pastor Bob? Ruth a Moabite. Big deal. No, it is really a big deal. Here's why. Ruth, a poor Gentile who doesn't have enough money to even buy food. She's kind of stuck, not really sure what to do. She has great need, but doesn't know where she'll have that need met. And when she thinks even about the promises of God that are obvious in Naomi's life, the picture of the Jewish nation, she knows, according to God's word, listen to this, the Bible tells us that she cannot enter the congregation of the Lord. In other words, according to the law, a Moabite cannot enter the congregation or the covenant of the Lord. Now you've got to add something else to this. Where do the Moabites come from? Just jot it down for a reference. You can read the story later on. It's kind of, you know, sensational nonetheless. You remember when Lot fled Sodom and Gomorrah? God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. He leaves. Lot's wife turns to a pillar of salt because she turns back. He's got his two daughters with him. They flee and they hide in a cave. Now that they're in the cave, the two sisters begin to talk amongst themselves. I don't know what's going to happen to our family. Now that our mom turned into a salt lick, this is so sad. We're not sure what we'll do. One of the daughters comes up with this brainiac idea. She says, I got an idea. Why don't we get daddy, Lot, drunk? And then I'll sleep with him. Tomorrow night, we'll get him drunk again. You sleep with him, and we'll have a family. Uh, Incestual. uh, Exactly. And that's what happens in Genesis 19. You're thinking, I never read that. That's weird. But I'll read that tonight. That's weird. Now, here's what happens. The two daughters both get pregnant. And one of them gives birth to a boy named Moab. You mean to tell me Ruth, who is rescued from Naomi, actually is linked to? Oh, incestual. Exactly. You see, she's not just a Gentile. She's a wild Gentile. She's the kind of person you look on and go, I don't want anything to do with that family. I don't know where they live in the hills, but I don't want to go near there. No, 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 no. That's even a more beautiful picture. Here's why. In our chapter, we will meet someone very, very special. See, Ruth will find herself in the field, gleaning. And that's a type of the world. Ruth will find herself in that field during a time of harvest. And harvest is speaking to the end of the age. And she will find herself meeting a man named Boaz. And Boaz is for us a type of Christ the Redeemer. Okay, now, we're setting the stage. Why? This is a glorious drama because we have a poor Gentile who has no hope that's soon going to meet a wealthy Jewish man who owns all the property that is going to feel very, very compassionate toward the Gentile. And he, listen to this, and I'm going to spoil the rest of the story. He marries her. Oh, it's a great, great wedding ceremony. They have a child named Obed. Obed happens to be the grandfather of David. And through David, we have Jesus Christ. Do you see this? Well, wait a second. Boaz is related to Jesus. He, very Jewish, he ends up marrying, oh, the Gentile nation. So it's by the blood that the Jew and the Gentile have access to the kingdom of God. Today on the Active Word. Today on the Active Word. Maybe God just decided, you know what? I'm going to set aside Israel. I will now bless the Gentile people, but for the Jew, now, no longer. You ever thought that thought? They did in Paul's day. Love means never needing to say you're sorry. At least that's what Ryan O'Neill and Allie McGraw would have had us believe in the old movie Love Story. Remember that one? But anyone who's married knows that love means having to say you're sorry a whole bunch. So what can we know about love? Well, today on The Active Word. Maybe God just decided, you know what? I'm going to set aside Israel. I will now bless the Gentile people. But for the Jew, now, no longer. You ever thought that thought? 
they did in Paul's day. Love means never needing to say you're sorry. At least that's what Ryan O'Neill and Allie McGraw would have had us believe in the old movie Love Story. Remember that one? But anyone who's married knows that love means having to say you're sorry a whole bunch. So what can we know about love? Well, today on The Active Word, Pastor Bob Coy will show us what God has to say about true, redemptive love. Let's join Pastor Bob now for this study of the book of Ruth. The message is called Romantic Redemption. Love story. Ruth and Naomi. If you're my age, Ryan and Allie. What's that? Well, your Snickers do reveal that some of you remember quite well. The year 1970, the then Hollywood hotties, Ryan O'Neill and Ally McGraw, starred in a film. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Yeah, love story. Love story. And that was a time when love. It was a time when love was free. And love was foolish. Love was sweet. 